Thank you for listening to My Best Living Pod. We are currently accepting applications for advertisement and sponsorships. You can reach us at My Best Living Pod or My Best Living Pod at gmail.com. Thank you. Hello and welcome to another episode of our podcast, My Best Eleven. My name's Andrew McMillan and as ever, we are joined by my co-host, Marvin Johnson. How are you, Marvin? Good morning. I'm very good, thank you, Andrew. I'm very excited because we're going back to my youth days with today's guests. Excellent. Of course, um, today we are joined by... um, a player who's played a number of games at Luton, Nottingham Forest, and then spent quite a lot of time on the east coast of England, um, like going all the way up there for a number of clubs. So we're joined today by Kingsley Black. Kingsley, how are you today? Um, I'm very well, thank you. It's, uh, t- t- it's nice to be involved. Um, uh, pleasure to, to uh, initially meet you. And uh, obviously, I know Marvin very well from uh, many years at, uh, at Luton and uh, many good memories in the youth team as well as the first team. So good morning yeah. to you both. Morning, Kings. Good morning. So we'll, we'll jump straight in. Um, so what we're looking to do is, um, first of all, uh, find out your Picking your first 11, hopefully Marv's given you a bit of time to do some thinking and um, rather than doing it off the cuff. So what formation are you going for? Yeah, interesting. Well, um, as a, an attacking, um, sort of attacking minded player, um, probably come as no surprise to you, Marv, but I'm actually going to go with 4-3-3. <laughs> so uh, there are good attacking options and good passes in midfield and uh, a very strong set of personalities. So wow. um, that's, uh, that might be the biggest problem if, if it was um, technically real, <laughs> with getting everyone who's got such a big personality in the same room um, coordinating. But uh, on paper, this, this team works for me. Um, it's got everything that, that um, you know, I, I think a team should have. It's got leadership, it's got pace, it's got skill, it's got uh, um, intelligence and, and it's got goals. So um, that's, Looking forward to it. this is going to be my team. Excellent. Okay. So we'll jump straight in then. Um, in goal, um, obviously you play with a number of um, different um, goalkeepers in your time. What we like to do um, on the podcast is, is if you can give us a few clues who it is so our listeners can try and guess on their way to work or while they're out running or walking. Um, so if you can give us a couple of clues for each position, that'd be fantastic, Kingsley. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, initially, I, I know that, um, um, as with Marv, we've all played with... Um, um, a number of um, you know excellent players so sometimes uh, other people can get a mention here but uh, I'll, I'll lead into who I've chosen but uh, you know a typical mention to someone like Alec Chamberlain who was an excellent um, shot stopper uh, at Luton, um, Mark Crossley um, yep. someone who uh, w- was a, a big character at Nottingham Forest um, became excellent actually when they changed the rules because he, he was a actually very accomplished um, striker of the ball. So he was able to play and uh, control the ball, which is what is needed sometimes now in the modern game. So he was slightly ahead of his time um, in terms of that. Um, Tommy Wright for Northern Ireland was a great keeper. Um, a couple of guys at uh, Grimsby, Aidan Davison, uh, Danny Coyne, um, excellent sort of shot stoppers, very hard to beat in training and, and were excellent goalkeepers. Uh, but I'm actually going to go with someone who uh, w- was an enormous character. Um, Marvin knows him very well. Um, you know, started life uh, East End. I think he was a, a okay. West Ham fan, actually. And, uh, you know, had, had a, a number of uh, good years at Luton um, alongside ourselves. Um, and also went on to further success at... Um, you know, Manchester United and, and a number Les. of clubs, really. In, in big games, big important games, because he had the big personality to cope with the big occasion. So, um, Les Seeley is, Les Seeley. Is, is my number one. Um, and I will tell you that um, back in the day, uh, that when there was literally one substitute, it was the job of that substitute to warm the goalkeeper up. 
And I was just, um, I spent um, a season uh, as, as number 12, really, at Luton um, <laughs> as a young player. And my job was to warm Les up. Now, where, Les was a very, very much a stickler for perfection. You know, so we'd go out and he'd want the crosses at the right height. He'd want everything, he wanted everything to perfection. And if, if you didn't actually perform and didn't give him the crosses in the right place, he would actually castigate you in front of um, the fans as they were coming into the ground. So you, you were petrified during this warm-up. And uh, it was such a relief when, when it was over that the actual match itself didn't pose any, uh, any nerves <laughs> whatsoever. All I was worried about was warming Les up. And then the, the football match, actually, I couldn't wait to get on and actually play because uh, that, that, that didn't seem quite so nerve-wracking. But warming Les up. But what he did tell me, what he did teach me rather, was, you know, a professionalism uh, at all times, really. And I always got on with him and always bumped into him when he was at other clubs. So um, I looked up to Les and uh, he's my number one. Excellent. Excellent. I, I, I told a story when I, I think it was on your podcast, Andrew, it's not called soccer, about, I don't know if you played Kings, it was at Millwall away and we had got beat 2-1, I think, I think myself, Dave Oldfield, I'm not sure if you played it, and Ray Hartford was the manager and we come in and it's I think there was a good few of us and Les just like you know what Les was he's just like off his I mean he said it how it was didn't he he was like we ain't gonna got no chance with these effing kids in the team and all that do you remember that conversation or not after well, I, the game yeah 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 I think because sometimes um at that point you know um the, the, the heat is flying around and the, uh, <laughs> you know it's uh, it's a difficult situation and as you say Les would he, he saw it how it was at that time um and, uh, you know, he'd let you know. He wasn't afraid to actually, um, you know, voice his opinion. And that was the strength I admired in him, actually. You know, whether he was right on that, I'm not sure. But, but, but he had the strength of personality to, um, you know, um, for, for the situation that, that evolved. So, yeah. Um, and I, and, yeah. I, and, I said at the, and I said at the time, it didn't offend me. It just made me appreciate that <clears throat> he could be honest and treat me like a yeah. man, even though, <clears throat> excuse me, I was, a, I, was a, I was a boy, 18, playing in the team, and I respected him for that. It made me grow up a lot quicker and made yeah. me a lot more tougher mentally. Well, I, th I think you were able to see through, through his professionalism and the way he reacted and the way he uh, addressed himself, what, what was needed to become, you know, um, a, a, a top professional, really, because that's what, um, you know, Les certainly was. And uh, he instilled that um, character um, in, in others. And... Uh, that, that, I, I agree with you, Mark. I agree. So, yeah. Excellent. Now, great, great pick. Right back. Um, I'm assuming we're going for a back four, right back, left backs, two centre backs? Yes, indeed. So, um, right backs have played also um, with, with, with some very good ones. Um, uh, Gary Charles at Nottingham Forest was a good young player, um, very athletic, uh, uh, good skill, um, as was Brian Laws. Um, you know, Brian was good uh, defensively. Um, good tackler, um, read the game well. Um, also a guy at Grimsby called John McDermott, whose record appearance holder yeah. um, was a very good player. He, one of them players that was, you know, never under a 7 out of 10, just, just very consistent, a very good player. Um, but I needed someone who, um, in, with my uh, tight three-man midfield, um, was powerful and athletic and was able to get, um, you know, up and down the line. So I've chosen someone with great athleticism and, um, and that is uh, someone that we played with at Luton, Marv. Uh, Tim Breaker. Tim Breaker. Tim Breaker. Tim Breaker. Yeah. You know, a very good athlete, good crosser of the ball, which is important um, for my front three. And also because of my tight three-man midfield, I needed someone who was, um, you know, strong enough to get up and down that line for 90 minutes. And, and, and Tim w was certainly, certainly that player. Um, so Tim. that is my right back. So uh, No, I agree. <clears throat> I agree with you, Tim. Like, that's all I, I remember um, when I was sort of like just about coming to the team was Tim was just energy. Energy, energy, energy is just like up and down, up and down. And like you said, was a, a very good deliverer of the ball in the final third. But 
the main thing what stood out was his energy of getting up and down, which could be so soul destroying, I think, for maybe an attacking player who was maybe playing against him because you know you know yourself being um, an attacker, if if they're getting forward, you gotta do your job and get back and defend as well. Yeah, well, I, I sort of had the uh, pleasure or displeasure of playing against him a few times when he was playing for Queen's Park Rangers and for West Ham. So, and you know when you play against someone, I knew what he was like because obviously in training and things, but it uh, was, was a tough opponent. Someone who's going to, you know, uh, not going to give you an inch. He's going to back you for 90 minutes and you've got to be on top of your game to get the, the better of him, really. So, um, yeah, um, Tim, for me, at right back. So, um, and now yeah. going into... Um, you know, uh, the possibly the right-handed centre half. Uh, there's a number of people that that, that uh, could could fill this role. Uh, Mal Donaghy would have been um, someone who would, uh, you know, could could easily play in this team, um, and certainly certainly good enough. Um, another great athlete, another strong, another good leader. Read the game well, mm. you know, um, and was able to, you know, I think he nearly played 100 caps for Northern Ireland, as well as playing for Manchester United and, yeah. and Chelsea. Um, yeah, I saw a uh, post about Maldoni here the other day and people saying that they reckon that it was a snip. I think it was 850,000 they got him for. Um, yeah. They reckon yeah. Well, I think, was, I think, 89, I think it was, he went. About that. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, Luton actually purchased him for um, next to nothing um, from, from Larn, uh, a Northern Ireland club, you know, um, as a young player. <laughs> And he matured into, um, um, you know, a, a, a wonderful sort of right-hand sided um, centre back. Um, as was um, Alan McDonald for Northern Ireland, um, Queens Park Rangers player, was, was a good, good, strong centre half, a leader of men. Um, but I'm going to go with this right centred half, right sided centre half, um, as a, a colleague um, at Nottingham Forest. Um, someone who had fantastic pace, very rarely would anyone get the better of him, was a member of um, the England side in yeah, Italian Walker. 90. Des Walker. Walker. With, with Des Walker. Yeah. So, you know, Des was, um, in that Nottingham Forest side, um, you know, there was uh, generally a couple of marauding fullbacks and... Um, and Des, you could practically leave Des up there um, at the back on his own, and um, <laughs> everyone else would be bobbing forward. Leave Des at the back, and, and actually he would solve all the problems. So uh, if we ever did get caught out, so it was a fantastic insurance policy to have someone of of his pace and and, and stature and confidence. You know, just a a, 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 a fantastic player. Yeah, um, and going into. Um, well, could, could let's go back to Des. Side. What what was Des like in the dressing room with um, Brian Clough? Um, obviously, he was there when Cluffy was there, and um, did they? Because Des came across as somebody who was quite a quiet personality on the pitch. Um, was he that off the pitch? Was or did him and Cluffy? Um, obviously, I know he wasn't captain all the time. What was it like? Um, he, he certainly wasn't quiet off the pitch. He was very much his own man. Um, had a good relationship with, with Brian Clough, but I think they left each other to their own devices, if you know what I mean, because <laughs> Brian Clough knew what he was going to get from Des, and however Des wanted to, um, you know, um, however he wanted to train or however he wanted to prepare, he, he always played fantastically well on, on a Saturday or whenever. So um, I think they just had a good relationship, a, a very professional relationship, but... Um, um, Des was not quiet, really, off the pitch. He, he, was, he, he had a lot more. No, he talent. wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 can vouch, I can vouch for that because um, when um, I got married the first time, it was a case where I, I had a lot of family kings in Nottingham. So aunties, yeah. uncles and stuff. So I planned my stag weekend in Nottingham. <clears throat> so... I remember speaking to Oaksy and saying, this is what I'm doing. And he said, oh, we, we give Des a ring because Des was with Oaksy at um, Sheffield Wednesday um, yeah. at some point. And so he goes, okay. And so we went and he lived in Nottingham and him and Oaksy were still very close. And so we went out into Nottingham, as you do, and 
And he said, oh, I've invited Des, you don't mind. I said, Des who? He said, Des Walker. I said, yeah, no problem. And he'd come out and like you said, he, he's not very quiet. He's a, he's a life and soul of the party. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely so. Definitely so. But uh, yeah. And, and now going into um, the left-hand side of the centre-back, really. Um, um, although the person I'm actually going to choose um, is right-footed, but um, I, I must admit I do like a, a, a balance, um, you know, of centre halves. But um, it was very difficult to leave this this particular person out of the side. But um, Marv, you, you were uh, just outside um, <laughs> uh, for someone. I, I, I must say, for someone, I've never seen anyone who could lift the crowd so much with one of his marauding runs forward when he would go on a little bit of a mazy the crowd would go absolutely mad and and something would invariably happen you'd either you know um you know, make a good pass or but it certainly lift the crowd so um you know you're just outside of the just outside uh, the flip, just outside uh, just out just outside but <coughs> that's, uh, that's cool and just and and um you, you you'll understand why in a moment um jerry taggart was another one who was um a, a good, good, um, you know, good ball playing centre half, yeah. um, who uh, also um, had an excellent sort of Premier League career and, and Northern Ireland. Um, but the, the person that um, I'm going to choose, um, again, someone you know very well and someone I feel that you would definitely um, look up to. Yeah. He was someone who was very much the leader of um, our football club, Luton Town, at the time. Um, Steve Foster? And, uh, Steve Foster, yeah. yeah. And someone who's a very, very good friend of mine, actually. But at the, at the time, um, you know, uh, as with you, Marv, we, we were the young players in that side. Yeah. And Fozzie was very much a senior player, someone who'd been to the World Cup, had an amazing presence about him. And... Um, he was someone that um, would perhaps be jovial, um, laughing and joking through the training all week, but, but, but always train. Um, but then uh, on a um, three quarters of an hour before kickoff uh, on match day, there would be a, a, a professionalism in him that was exemplary. And uh, he would just turn into a complete and utter total professional who was completely focused on his own performance and about, you know, the, the performance of the team in order to get a result. So um, I looked up to Fozzie. I thought he was uh, um, a, a great leader and, uh, you know, and, and he's also a good friend of mine now, but uh, um, I, he's nice to spend time in his company. Um, like, I mean, like you just said, what a leader and someone I did look up to playing in that position and learn ever so much from just by watching him. And again, when Andrew and I came up with this idea, he was one of the first names, believe it or not, who I was thinking about getting on here at the moment. I'm, I mean, he says he said yes, but I know, I mean, he's been a little bit like quiet. I mean, I'm going to reach out to Bertie at some point to see like, because I don't want to force or push anyone into a situation to do something just because it's me, because I know I, Similar to yourself, I have a really good relationship with Fozzie. And so he, he did say, look, oh, yeah, I'll do it for you, Marv, anything for you, Marv. But, like, you know, I know he's a bit quiet and he's down there in Brighton and he likes to keep himself to himself. So we'll just have to see if we can get him on yeah. here. Well, that'd be good. That'd be something worth watching because I know Fozzie played with some wonderful oh. players. I think he started at um, Portsmouth with George, alongside yeah. George Graham and... Um, and obviously he was a massive leader of um, Brighton and then went on to Villa yeah. before Forest and, uh, sorry, Forest before Luton. And uh, just a great, great character, really. Oh, um, brilliant character. Brilliant. I just yeah. fingers crossed I can get him, I can get him on it, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah, you, just, maybe you might have, maybe you might have to put a good word in for me, Kings, and persuade him I'll when you talk to him. Well. <laughs> I'll have to go for a glass of rosé with him, but uh, <laughs> in London. <laughs> Not for a long yes. time now, various things, but uh, yeah, well, I'll, I'll have to ask him for you. But um, yeah, but that, and moving on to uh, my, left, my back. left back. Yes, left back. Um, again, some good players alongside. Um, Rob Johnson played well, certainly in the Liverpool's Cup final, was a very good defender. Um, 
Uh, Richard Harvey has a great left foot for you, Marv, as well. Yeah. So you, you know him, um, you know Dick Harvey very well. Yeah. Two guys at uh, Grimsby were good players as well, um, underrated. Um, Tony Gallimore, um, you probably might not know Tony, but he was a good, good left back. As was David Smith, who you probably remember yeah. from his commentary days playing um, slightly yeah. further forward, but he, he, he turned up at uh, left back. But um, th th this person was, it was only ever going to be one person for me, another leader of men, another uh, fantastic personality, totally in charge of the dressing room at Nottingham Forest, even Des Walker, and um, uh, again, someone who Brian Clough um, respected, um, called him his skipper, and uh, um, did you, what did you say there, Mark? Did you, Stuart yeah. Pearce? Stuart, Stuart Pearce. Pearce, you've got Stuart, yeah, yeah. He, he was um, another fantastic player, um, in fact, he was when, when I played alongside him. Um, Stuart would play the ball out wide, so you'd be on the touchline, and then he would make the run, which was totally different to what you used to do with with other fullbacks. They would let right. you try and do something, take on a fullback, or play it around the corner, or, or try and link up with the striker. But with Stuart, he would um, he would pass the ball to you, and then he would underlap, so he would go on the inside of you. You know, and you'd give him the ball back because literally he was one. He was in a good position, and two, he demanded it. So uh, right. you give the ball back, and then he was attacking from from the inside channel. Um, you know, and uh, he's he, he, and from that sort of mentality, he scored an awful lot of goals actually, yeah. getting forward from left back more so than anyone else I could could name in that position. Um, and and again, someone who could uh, could tackle. Uh, was um, a good passer of the ball and uh, just someone that, that lifted his team and, and demanded, literally demanded, you know, everything from um, all his teammates. So um, just just another leader, another another inspirational player. So, I just um, I just want to touch on what you just said there um, about Richard Darwin and just remind me something from our youth team days like and you mentioned it earlier on as well about having the balance I mean we were quite successful in, as a youth team in a couple of cup, um, cup competitions and do you think the fact that it was myself being a left footer left side of centre half and then to the left of myself was Richard Harvey left footer in front of yeah. you in front of Richard Harvey was yourself, left footer, left midfield, and even in the centre midfield, on the left hand side, another left footer, Aaron Ty. Aaron Ty, so we, we had, yeah. We had, we had a balance there, which I mean, I mean, David Coach was like, he just loved it, because there was no chance of any of us, like, especially yourself and Aaron, coming back on our right foot if you're down in the left wing position, same with Richard Harvey, it's always going to come in. And yeah. I just thought that was, I mean, I don't know if that's happening at too many clubs to have on the left-hand side all left-footed players. Well, it's unusual these days. I mean, I, um, I'm, I'm keen to get some left-footed players in, in this team for, for the, just the, the, the reasons that, uh, that, that you've just mentioned. And you left me out. Left you left me out. Or, I'm left-footed, Kings. You think I'm left-footed. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> he hasn't. He hasn't, got to the, he hasn't got to the strikers yet, Marv. Just wait. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was thinking about you in the centre half position because I think you played there more than left back. But uh, no, that's true. That is, that is, that yeah. is true. But no, yeah. no, only joking. But like, yeah, I think, like you said, I think the, we had a great balance uh, with our youth team. Being all left footers on that left side of the field. I mean, I don't, I don't know if that ever yeah. happened again. I mean, that was very yeah. rare. I remember a game, Marv, and um, it was the under-17 South East Counties, and we were top of the league, and uh, we went away to the team, which was Oxford, who were actually second in the league, and we won 13-0 with that youth team. And actually, I think practically every single one of the, those players in that youth team played at some point in the first team. Um, right. You know, we it's incredible. Strong. It doesn't happen. It really doesn't no, happen. Exactly. Yeah. Really strong youth so, team, yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah. So, um, no, good memories. And David Coach, you touched on there, yeah. was someone who, um, who who gave me confidence in, in that youth team. He was someone that um, 
you know, I certainly looked up to. Um, I was so passionate about the game. You know, he was quite. He, he'd talk about it for, for an hour. What one time did he didn't even go out training because he was just. That's what, see, I mentioned that on my um, the podcast yeah. and Andrews. I mentioned that. I said, well, yes. I mean, David Coach yeah. is so infectious, and he used to like talk. And before you know it, it'll be like, oh, oh, guys, oh, uh, we didn't train, did we? But it wasn't a case of like. <laughs> We wanted to go out and train because he was boring. The stories were actually quite oh, interesting. Right. And yeah, so yeah. I, t- I mentioned that. Um, unbelievable. Yeah, and you, yeah. And you no, obviously, nice Marv, Marv, Marv also mentioned um, training in the gravel. Um, on the, on gravel the car park. parking. Oh, the car park. Outside yeah, yeah. Out yeah. the car park recently yeah. on a Wednesday yeah, yeah. night. Well, that, that was because we used to go to the ground and, and, and you'd go into the... You'd, the reserve team changing room really i think the first team was out of bounds that changing room and uh, that was the only place to go because it was uh, well I say it was it was it wasn't a floodlit football pitch it was a floodlit car park yeah. and uh, and it was it was bumps and all sorts on it it was terrible really yeah, no. i mean it's, i don't think you'd get away with it today but no uh, not a, not a hell in chance getting away with that in today's yeah. health and safety no chance and <laughs> I, I, I said at the time, I just can't believe, I mean, I don't remember. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there would, would be an occasion where someone did get hurt. But on that hard concrete, I do not remember anyone getting a very serious injury, which is remarkable. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was a bit like uh, at that age, you know, you, you spent a lot of time on, on, on a playground, didn't you? That's at school, true. because that's what you did. Yeah. You just played football at every opportunity at break or lunchtime and stuff like that. So it, it just felt like the same, you know, and we enjoy playing football. And yeah. as, a, as a non-player, I find that incredible that even back then, I mean, when I was growing up, we used to have our training sessions at things like the dr- drill hall. I don't know if you remember those type of places in ha- in yeah. Hightown. Um, out the back yes. there, there used to be the old air raid shelter and they put some dodgy five-a-side bitch in there. Um, used to hire there or go over to Lee Manor. So there's, I, I find it incredible. You've got a, a group of... Um, players, even in the late 80s, that are coming through as professionals, uh, coming through Luton Town, who are a top, top, top club, that didn't you even use Astros or, do you know what I mean, didn't use Lee Manor or any of those type of places which um, yeah. which had facilities. And I know I, I speak about um, High Town Rec, but that was quite a famous one for using in the back of the air raid shower. Yeah, no, well, many a game there, so yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's nice that the facilities now for, for people have, have improved because I think there's less less people playing in parks with their friends and more organised football. So, you know, there's more AstroTurf and 3 and 4G facilities that, uh, which is a great thing really for, for um, you know, kids coming through. Yeah. So, um, awesome. Yeah. Thank you very much. So um, what we'll do is we will pause there um, and we will pause for a, um, a quick break um, and we'll come back after part um, one um, and we'll hear from part two from Kingsley who will go through his midfield and attack. We are from our sponsors. We are back now for part two. We have Kingsley Black here. Just to recap those people who've forgotten in our small little interlude from our sponsors. Um, in goalkeeper, we've got Les Seeley, uh, right back Tim Breaker. Centre backs we have Des Walker, Steve Foster, and a left back of course we have Steve. Uh, sorry, Steve Pierce, Stuart Pierce. Um, <laughs> so fantastic defence. But now is where it gets really interesting. Of course, Kingsley was well known for being a attacking midfielder. So back over to you, Kingsley. Um, anywhere across your midfield three, how are you wanting to do? Yeah. Well, I'll start on the right hand side. Um, and again, going into some good, good players that, uh, uh, you know, can feel um, that, you know, that they've been left out of this team. Um, Danny Wilson was, a, was an excellent player for, mm-hmm. for Luton, various clubs, Northern Ireland. Um, uh, Kevin Donovan, who you might know from West Brom days, but I, I played with him um, at uh, Grimsby. Um, had, a, you know, two or three fantastic years there. He was um, an excellent player. Um, and um, I remember when I first joined uh, Nottingham Forest, there was um, there's a guy, and I and he was training with the first team, and I couldn't, I didn't understand why he wasn't playing really. But he, at the time, he'd just come back from a broken leg, so um, you know it took a little bit um, of, of confidence and things. And that was someone called Steve Stone, and um, and a, a year later or so, he, he had established himself in. Um, 
certainly Frank Clark's team, um, and and then the England side actually played played a few games. And, and you're a ninety six, um, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he did he actually. I remember I, I saw it recently, and he came on um, a couple of big games actually. So um, you know, alongside you know some of those big England players, and uh, he um, he did really well. So he was he, I, I think he was an excellent player. Um, but the the, the person that um, that I'm going to have in this right hand side of the three, so tucked in really. Um, is someone that I um, again looked up to at uh, Luton. Had um, enormous feet. I think he was size eleven, but had the best touch of any of these footballers on it, that I'm going to name in this team. Um, would be a good friend of yours, Mark. Too. Um, big feet. Big feet. Played in the Woods Cup final. Oh, Ricky Hill. Ricky Hill. Ricky, Ricky Hill. Ricky yeah. Hill, yeah. I, I, you know, when when Ricky was in his prime, um, we were sort of just coming through, yeah. and uh, I remember one particular. Um, it, it was uh, Kenworth Road. Um, I think it was the, the AstroTurf pitch was still there at the time, Marv, and um, I think I was about sixteen. I'm not sure you were there at the time, and uh, I'd been invited to pre-season training, and. Uh, it was a practice game. I think it was on the Wednesday before the season kicked off on, on the Saturday or whatever. And uh, it was a full-scale first-team versus reserve practice game on the pitch. And David Pleat comes up to me and he says, would you like to be involved in the game? And I'm going, yeah, 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 quite excited. So from behind his back, he handed me the, uh, the, the, the linesman flag. And I had <laughs> made the assistant referee. <laughs> So there I was running up and down the line, you know. And uh, but the funny thing was, um, with about 20 minutes to go, some, I can't remember who got injured, but someone got injured. And uh, um, David Pete was refereeing. Um, he, I was the only one that had the kit on at the time. So uh, I was brought on to, to replace uh, the injured player. And I remember Mark, I was playing alongside Ricky, or Mark and Ricky, I should say. Yeah. And uh, I just, it was like seeing him at first hand in an actual right. match situation, albeit a practice match, was amazing. And it was because someone that I'd been in awe of as a Luton fan growing up, mm. to then be on the same pitch and, and furthermore to actually play in the same side at a later date um, was great for me. And I also remember coming back from, um, I was walking out of the Brace, which was the training ground at Luton pre-season, I think one of the early days, and I, again, 16, and I was walking up the road, and um, uh, this the white Astra pulls up, and it was Ricky, Ricky with, with Mark Steen in the front, because they were going back to North London, and he says, where are you going? And I said, oh, well, I'm just going up, uh, up London Road, so I'm going that way, jump in, and he gave me a lift home, and uh, he didn't know me, I was a kid, I was just another 16-year-old trialist, if you like. But right. uh, he gave me a lift home and he was playing Sister Sledge at full volume <laughs> in his car. <laughs> and uh, it, it, it was great. I was just hoping that someone would see me getting out of Ricky Hill's car because <laughs> I thought he was an absolute legend. So uh, I yeah. know. Totally so, agree with you, Kings. I mean, I've mentioned it many a time. Um, he's the best player I've I've played with at Luton. There's been some great players, you know, like you got, you mentioned yeah. there's Mick Arthur, there's Brian Sting, Steve Foster, but <clears throat> just for sheer all round ability, scoring goals, passing, skill, heading, Ricky had it all, like you said. Yeah, Fantastic. Yeah. And player. power and skill. Yes. You know, I, I, I agree with you. He's probably one of the most skillful, you know, I don't know whether he got the credit. And he certainly deserved. Um, more England caps. I, I think yeah. he only got a couple. Yeah, really. Agree. He, yeah, he, he, you know, totally agree. Um, you know, a bit unfortunate there. Just the timing of uh, uh, the era. But um, no, wonderful, wonderful uh, gentleman and a wonderful yeah. footballer. So, uh, yes. and another, one, another one. Another one. And another one. I'm hoping to have on here as well, King. I spoke to Rick, spoke to Ricky, and Ricky just said, "Yeah." Um, give me a shout uh, in a, maybe in a, a month or two once you've got going. He said because he's been doing yeah. quite a quite a few of them so again fingers crossed I've got tricky ricky yeah well, he speaks on. awfully well he's he's yeah. uh, he's very engaging and, uh, and and certainly very you know worth listening to so good luck with that so uh, i you. look forward to seeing that one too but Excellent. Uh, 
Yeah, going into so, my, um, my uh, central uh, midfield position, again, some good players with the likes of Jim McGilton at, at Northern Ireland. Um, a guy called Paul Groves was a good player at uh, yeah. Grimsby. He scored a lot of goals coming in um, late with headers, was good in the air. Um, at Forest, um, Scott Gemmell was was a good yeah. good player. Went on to have a good good career, um, yeah. you know, further on at uh, Everton. Everton um, yeah. But I'm going to go with someone who um, was a young player at Nottingham Forest at the time. Um, certainly not um, a young player on the pitch. He he, he played it, uh, immensely well. Went into a different role later in his career. Um, because at Forest he was someone who could bomb on, as they say, because um, he, he was actually exceptionally quick, which people didn't realise, and um, had strength and power, and one of the best passers, certainly in, in the modern game, um, uh, which was proved at Manchester United. So, yeah. yeah, good old Roy, Roy Keane. Keane. Roy, yeah. Keane. Roy Keane, indeed, yeah. So, um, just a, a great player, really. Um, what was obviously still learning at Forest, but, but was probably still one of the, certainly one of the best players there and, and went on to a magnificent career. And again, another, another leader, really, although in the early days at Forest, you know, um, certainly Stuart would, was the leader of, of and, and, and Des as well. But uh, um, I think Roy certainly looked up to them too and saw them as mentors, as, as we did perhaps with the likes of um, Steve Foster, um, Marv. So, um, yeah. What, yeah. What age, so sorry, what age was he when he came to Forest? When he, um, you know, when I think Roy's about three years younger than me. So I think he was there at sort of 19. And, and I think he immediately got in the team, played in the cup final, didn't he? Yeah. And um, and then um, you know just uh, I think he was established then he wasn't like one of them young players that had a game and then oh he doesn't play for six months mm. he, he he played the first game and I think he then continued That's to be it. in the side right I don't think he actually left the side and and, and that shows you what Brian Clough knew he knew that yeah. he had some a, a and real did, talent and did, he, there. And, and did he have that strong personality came what he as a young nineteen year old did you see he that was developing it. Yeah. He was developing it. He, you know, there'll be people, you know, what the change rooms like because some of the older guys are, have got stronger personalities. But um, uh, what, if they decided they wanted to sort of say something to him, he would stand up to them, um, and um, and they would soon back down. So you know, there was early signs of him, you know, developing that um, mentality, and um, and certainly what he went on to do was phenomenal, really, and. Uh, and he's good to listen to now, uh, as a pundit, yeah. you know, because he speaks his mind. I yes. Guess. <laughs> true. That is true. That is true. I mean, um, would you say that Roy Keane is the type of player who you could tell was going to be great? Or could you tell he was going to be good? And what's the difference from your experience of seeing the two, Kingsley? Um, well, I, 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 I remember a game... Um, at Queen's Park Rangers and this summed it up for me uh, we were playing away Forest and um, uh, Ray Wilkins turned round to one of his players and uh, I just happened to be in earshot and he said who is that I said, who is that number six because I think he'd been either abroad he'd been in, in Scotland so he wasn't aware uh, of Roy Keane and he, so um, and he, he literally because he was at the end of his career perhaps in his defence but he couldn't keep up with him because the, 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 the pace and the power that, that, that Roy had. And, um, and I think that's the, pe the thing that people didn't know because when they watch Manchester United, they see him as a passer, as a holder, but, uh, you know, midfielder. But um, really, he, he, at Forest, he bombed on, um, you know, and, and no one could really could go past the strikers, get on the end and score goals, you know. So um, just just an exceptional talent, really. So it was interesting to see how Sir Alex Ferguson changed him as a player, mm. you know, um, because I suppose he had other players that, that um, in, in that particular team that were were doing certain things. So maybe he he needed someone to to hold um, and and play, you know, in in a more conservative way, really, but but yeah. also in a, in, a, in a way of, of leading the team and. Um, and dictating play, really. So, um, yeah, so, so no real doubt that he was going to go on to um, 
you know, to be a great player, really, for, from, from my point of view. Um, Excellent. Yeah. So, uh, moving on to the left left side, then. Left side is is is, is, it, is uh, it competition here, Marv. I know you didn't really play in midfield, so I'm I'm <laughs> leaving you out of that one again. But, uh, uh, <laughs> but um, I did play alongside a few um, very good players that, that, that control football matches. Uh, Michael Hughes, West Ham, yeah. Northern Ireland. Um, yeah. I think Man City. Um, Ian Wone at Forest. Um, yeah. Was a good player, although I think he he was more would be in a four four two really um, on the left hand side. But he could certainly play there. But actually, um, um, again, Mark Pembridge was was a great yeah. player. I thought had a had a great career moving on from Luton. Was a fantastic athlete. Um, you know, ninety minutes was was, was a breeze for him. You know, yeah. he'd, uh, he'd be one of them. A bit like Tim Breaker, he'd be one yeah. of them that, that, that would be still running at the same pace, uh, you know, after 90 minutes as, as he did starting the game, and he's starting quick enough. So, um, Norman Whiteside was a good player, he could play there, Northern Ireland days. But I'm going to go with someone again, Marv. I think you played an awful lot of games with uh, um, this guy, he was very small in stature, but oh, not. Oh, yes. in, not in the way he could run a football match. So, <laughs> yes. God bless him. <laughs> yes, David Priest. David Priest. Well, yes. David Priest. Yeah, Mini. Um, Priestley was. Um, I'd, he, for me, he played with intelligence. He always played the right pass. Was always looking forward. You know. Um, you know. So he's looking for to go further up the pitch with. You know that the way he passed the ball, whether it was wide or, or into mid half, he liked that diagonal ball, and uh, the um, he, he could for someone who wasn't um, particularly quick, he, he he was very very quick of brain, yeah. and also could run a football match. He could dictate the pace of a football match with the way he passed the ball, um, and that was down to his intelligence and and his skill. And his passing ability, you know, he'd get on the ball, he'd pass it, he'd want it back. And it'd dictate play, really. And I think yeah. um, in this team, I just want people who um, would, would complement each other. And um, I've got good passers of the ball, really. I don't think we'd give the ball away too often because, um, <laughs> you know, people were, were, were clever in their passing, in, in, in certainly in, in the midfield and, and going forward now. So uh, David Priest for me. So, and, and Mark, you had the pleasure of playing with him. So, um, yeah, I'm very good player. Games. More games, many more games than I did. Like you said, I mean, you used to love nutmegging people, and I, I've never <laughs> seen anyone nutmeg as many people in games as Breezy did. I mean, you used to like say it as well as he, as he's going to do it. You used to say it, Megs, yeah. or keep those legs <laughs> shut, and just all you just hear him giggling, laughing as he did it. <laughs> but, but the strange thing with him, Kings, and you, and you know this, he could literally put that ball on a sixpence, couldn't he, with his left foot. He could yeah. put it wherever he wanted to. And I found this strange in one of the games that we, I don't know who we were playing at the time. I think it was, oh, who was it? Sheffield United, we, I was where we, and we had a penalty. And now, previously wouldn't take penalties. I didn't, and I'm thinking of someone of his ability who yeah. could put the ball anywhere. And I, and I ended up taking the penalty. I mean, centre back, I mean, I, I mean, I wasn't shy, but, um, we've lost Kings, he's gone. Oh, anyway, so he was like a little bit like, Hey, yeah. you take it, you take it, Marv. And I'm thinking after the game, I said, I mean, I said, Minnie, why would you not take penalties? He goes, I can't take penalties, it's just like too much time, or I just, I mean, I said, it's 12 yards out. He goes, I know, but I just don't want the, I just don't want the pressure. And I found that amazing that he said that for someone, like you said, he was like a little wizard yeah. and could put the ball anywhere, but having that onus of responsibility of being 12 yards out and that time to think about it maybe yeah. was just too much for him, I don't know. Yeah, no, yeah, I agree. For someone with a wand of a left foot, um, yeah, I didn't really know that, but um, I think the difference really, not, not, not with David, but uh, it's, you know, when the ball comes to in a split second, you haven't got time to yes. think, have you? And uh, when, you, when you're taking a penalty, there's, yeah, there's a goalkeeper, there's, you know, with shenanigans, the crowds, yeah. you know. And I think excited. that's what it was, and, and you've got time to think about it. And it's, um, yeah, and I think yeah, that's what it was. Situation. 
Yeah. I mean, I'm not, listen, I'm not saying he couldn't handle pressure, but I think, like you just said there, the, the time, the, why he was so good is that he ran a game. He could, like, literally do things and have about 10, 15 things going through his head, seeing that run, seeing that player, but made the correct pass at the right time. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So I think I've got good balance in that midfield, Mark. Yeah, I've, I've got passing, I've got power, I've got strength, I've got skill, and uh, you know, there, there's some goals there with, with certainly with, with Ricky and, uh, and and Roy Keane. So I think that that creates a good balance, um, and that would also allow Stuart Pearce to go forward, and it yes. would also allow Tim Brake to go forward. Um, That's true. Yes, very so, true. Yeah. So now I'm moving into. Um, my front three. So right. um, it's uh, um, uh, not a, a flat three, but uh, I'll probably go into how I would sort of adapt it and explain it. But I will go uh, my sort of first choice. Um, well, I, I shall probably name a few people that, that, that uh, should play. The likes of uh, Roy Wegerly. Roy was a good player. Um, yeah. Lars Elstrup. Lars had yeah. great pace, great left foot. Great, yeah. you know, good balance. Um, uh, Ian Dow was a good player, actually. I think Ian was able to hold the ball up um, yeah. and actually, you know, cause, you know, stress to centre-halves. You probably had the pleasure of playing against uh, Ian a few times if he was playing for um, Southampton, maybe. I don't know. But um, he, he would cause problems. And I enjoyed playing up front with Lars and Ian because right. uh, it was back in the day of Jim Ryan when Jim w was in charge. And... Um, he sort of gave us, as a front three, license to um, be anywhere um, in, in those three positions, as long as when the ball broke down, we got ourselves into a three. It wouldn't matter if I was in the middle or on the right, or Lars or, or Ian, although Ian would generally be the centre position, the focal, the focal, with yeah. myself and Lars going um, yeah. either side. But as long as we quickly got into like a defensive um, three, um, and then the, the offensive side uh, was unpredictable in terms of it was hard to defend against because we, we, people weren't just staying in, um, you know, easily marked positions. And I enjoyed that time. I really thought that was, that was, um, that was good. Yeah, but uh, breaking down, breaking yeah. down the, the, the tactics side of it then, you're talking about the front three. Um, you enjoyed obviously playing in the three from what you just said. Um, what was international football like in terms of playing? Obviously, you may have played with um, people like Dowie up front as well for um, Northern Ireland. Was What was it like playing yeah. for um, the international side and the tactics of playing up front? Was it something different? Were you expected to do something different? Yeah. Well, I, I think with Northern Ireland, it, um, and um, especially under, under Billy Bingham, who was a great manager, um, he, he generally was a 4-4-2. So... Um, it, you know, it was a bit more rigid in terms of, um, you know, some of the opposition that you were playing against had immensely talented players. So, we, you know, sometimes we had to go even play away and play five in midfield and, and be quite defensive, but it was just a way of trying to get a result, you know, away in Spain and um, Yugoslavia at the time, you know, teams with good skill and things. So, um, it wasn't such as a, a, an attacking side because of, of the quality of the opposition. You know, it was very much um, a, a time for you know, knowing who you're playing against. And then there was other games when you were more free-flowing because, you know, you, you were a stronger side than, um, you know, the opposition or, or at least uh, at the same level, which means that you can, you know, perhaps have a go at them. So I think it was just a different type of... Um, you know, set up really, depending on the opposition internationally, really. Um, yeah. yeah. And obviously playing at Windsor Park, Windsor Park as well, I'd have thought it was like a cauldron from what I, I've yeah. never been there. But I imagine it's very similar to the Kenilworth um, in that. Yeah, in that yeah, on a, on a bigger scale. Yeah, definitely. There was, there was always a great atmosphere there. Um, uh, you, you know, so, you know, sometimes can be a little tiny bit volatile as well, um, especially the games against the Republic of Ireland, which were, 100 mile an hour games, you know, there were some big games that we played against. Um, and we always seemed to get Spain as well, which was, uh, you know, in, all, in the group stages and Denmark as well. In fact, I remember one of the groups that we were in, um, I think that the, the top team qualified, which was Spain in our group, 
as did uh, Yugoslavia at the time, but then they had to pull out um, of this European Championship because of um, uh, various issues. And Denmark, who had come third uh, in the group, were then, um, uh, then, then went into the tournament and actually won it. From, won it, yeah. Uh, yeah, I from that, that position, yeah. which you wouldn't have, um, I think, last yeah. played, Lars Elstrup. So yeah. they, they had a good side anyway, but um, they didn't actually initially qualify, which is quite ironic. So it just yeah. shows you, you know, how international teams can change and evolve over quite a short period of time. Mm. But um, other players that were, were, were good was a guy called um, Jack Lester at uh, Grimsby, yeah. who went on to come a good career at Forest and, you know, was hard to play against, good skill, um, as was uh, Brian Roy. Brian was a skillful oh, player. Oh, I forgot about him. Yeah. yeah. Dutch yeah, player, yeah. wasn't he? Was he Dutch? Yeah, I think he was yeah. Dutch or something. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and good enough to play in, in an international Dutch side, oh. which tells you, um, uh, you know, what good player. Um, you know, he certainly was. Um, but my first um, pick um, up front, again, someone you know, Marv, and I think you would have played against him as well as with him on many occasions. Fantastic in the air. Um, an excellent touch for a big man. Mick. Um, Mick. Mick Harford. <laughs> Mick Harford, yeah. yeah. Harford. And certainly Mr. Luton, you know, he's, yeah, uh, definitely. he's, yeah. he's done, done a fantastic job in, in, in various guises over the years um, for Luton and, and still still doing such. Um, but Mick was, um, I thought Mick was, was a, a, a wonderful player, actually. He told me, actually, he said, um, when he first came, I think he came from Birmingham. That's right. And uh, the... Uh, the, 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 he came into a, what, what was a good footballing Luton side, especially on the AstroTurf. Um, you, you know, Priestley was there, and uh, there was lots of good footballers, Ricky and, 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 and Brian Steve. And um, the, um, he said he had to work in the afternoons. He'd go out on his own, with, you know, to, to work on his touch, because he felt at the time that uh, his touch wasn't sort of up to the standard of the likes of uh, Brian and... Uh, and Ricky and, um, and various. So he worked hard on his touch. And a couple of years later, when, you know, we were around, I, I, I look and I'd say, oh, there's a player with a fantastic um, skill on the deck, really, which I yeah. think he was perhaps not known for so much, Correct. apart from within his teammates. Yeah, and, I, I totally agree. Uh, and it's because he worked on it. He worked on it. Yeah. So, you know, I, yeah, by his own admission, um, he said it wasn't as natural, but uh, he certainly um, worked at it, and, and I thought he was excellent on the deck. And then crossing, he could make, from my point of view, and he didn't have to be a very good cross <laughs> for him to put it in the back of the net. <laughs> and I wonder, Marv, if you've ever played against him, how you feel the night before as a centre half, play, knowing that you're playing against Mick Harford the following day. Well, is that? <laughs> I, actually, I mean, I think a couple of times, I mean, when he was at Derby, um, yeah. played against him. But it wasn't a case where I feel I would be as bad the night before as another player would, because I knew him. I knew him. Even though yeah. I know, listen, Mick's going to give me a tough game, but at the end of the day, yeah. I know I was quite confident, shall I say, that I wouldn't be going home in an ambulance or have stitches and stuff like that <laughs> because like he though it'd be a tough you know you know Mick would like give you a tough game but at the same time he wouldn't intentionally I'm not saying he would intentionally hurt any other player who he didn't know but he would probably care a lot less about them if the ball's there and they're in the way Mick would like take out both basically whereas I'm thinking if he yeah. saw the ball and he saw me he might think mm, I might not quite get there as like at ahead of Marv, so I might just leave that one. I'd like to think he was thinking about that sort of thing in the game. If he thought he couldn't yeah. definitely get it, he would probably go, okay, let Marv have that one sort of thing. So, yeah, he was very, um, very impressionate as a as a big man and had a great touch, like you said. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and I, I agree. I agree. I, I thought, uh, and another someone else who's, um, you know, turned out to be a really good friend of mine, actually, he always seems yeah. to bump into me and, and socially, so um, an awful lot of respect for him. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And um, I've, I've gone into, um, I mean, Mick could certainly play in the centre, and I've right. just 
because there's going to be a little bit of movement from, right. from the person I have got in the centre who can, you know, tuck back into midfield. Yeah. But um, someone who can see himself um, unlucky to not be in this position is Brian Steen, because Brian was uh, uh, an excellent footballer, a wonderful finisher, one of the best finishers, actually. Um, you know, because uh, he used to pass the ball in the back of the net. He, he knew, a bit Jimmy Greaves-like, he, he knew that he didn't have to, um, you know, bust the footballs to, to beat. It just needed to be sometimes caressed into the back of the net. So, yeah. um, unfortunately, Brian's not quite made it, but, but, but you know, only by um, a fraction. Um, but the person um, that I have chosen is someone that can... Um, you know, drop into the midfield, which could help out my three men, um, and certainly um, turn and um, uh, create things. Another person that's really good in the air, um, from had the pleasure of playing with him at Nottingham Forest for a year, um, uh, before he left to play for Tottenham, and before he then went on to play for Manchester United, playing a big part in a massive success that they had. In the Champions League, I can see you're struggling with this one, Mark. Yeah, I'm struggling, oh. Andrew. <laughs> no, yeah, I've got it. Yeah, Teddy Sheringham. Teddy Sheringham is yes. uh, going to be playing up front, but can also drop into the midfield, which will allow Mick Harford to go into a centre position. But I think Mick can, can was good enough to, to even play a fraction wider um, and move into the centre. Um, and, and certainly Mick would, would, would benefit from those diagonal balls from David Priest as well in that, um, that slightly off right position really but, but Teddy would, would, um, would, would get goals there another person who was absolutely fantastic in the air uh, you know big guy great finisher mm. and uh, very intelligent which um, for someone with perhaps not um, electric pace um, bit slimmer to David Priest, was someone who could um, influence the game. Um, played until he was practically 40 because of his intelligence. Um, and um, I, I think uh, goals, I think he'd link up, link up well with uh, Mick Harford in this team because he could work off that because he, he reads the game well. Um, right. So um, I'd go with Teddy um, and he could also drop into midfield and, and help the play, you know. Um, and, and, um, and funny enough, which leads me... So again? Which leaves me with one last position. Um, now, I think this, this particular player, um, naturally, he won't be known. He's known as a striker. But uh, from my Forest days, I knew that he liked to drift out onto the left wing. Um, a right-footed player, but he was able to, you know, create some space by sort of dropping into a um, half-left wing position. And then he was able to drive inside uh, with his right foot, um, scored an awful lot of goals for Nottingham Forest um, from, from that very position, really, playing you know, in off, off the left a little bit and uh, scoring goals from outside the box. Generally quite spectacular. Uh, another big character. Uh, left Nottingham Forest to play for to Liverpool. Uh, Liverpool. And then went to Aston Villa, yeah. Indeed. I think you've yes. got it, Andrew. I haven't got it. I haven't got it. Stan Collymore. Oh, Stan Collymore. Stan yeah. Collymore. Yeah. 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 And, and right Stan would that. have the, the pace um, to, to upset any defence, really. So I, I feel that with, with Stan sort of in that position, and he could interchange a little bit with the other, the other two, uh, with Teddy dropping short. Um, any, any balls going to the box, Mick would, would be putting it across and there'd be lots of good movement. So I, th I think Stan would upset with his pace uh, and his shooting ability, um, you know, most teams. So um, I think... Stan the man. Stan the man. That is my 4-3-3. Three, three. Don't know what you think, but... Uh, I think no, no, that, that, that's, that, that's a good team, Kings. That is a good, good, Great good team. team. But the only thing now, what you've got to do is who who's going to lead them? You, you play some... Great managers, you got to think of your your manager. Who's? I mean, I have a rough idea who it could be, and uh, we haven't mentioned <laughs> him yet, and we have not had a story about him yet. But I mean, I could be wrong. Who, who, yeah. who, who's going to be the yeah. manager to lead them? Well, again, I go through. I, I remember, um, you know, sort of managers through um, the years when we when we look back at uh, the the youth team at Luton, really, because that that was a big part of our upbringing with David Coates. 
and another guy that uh, um, you know well in John Moore, Marv, who yeah. was yeah. another inspirational guy. I think he helped us both, you know, coming through the ranks at Luton. So someone I respect and, and someone that's definitely worth a mention. I know he was our manager for, for a year, but um, um, and then I had a good relationship with uh, uh, Ray Harford. Ray, yeah. for someone to... Um, to play a young player in the Littlewoods Cup final in myself took an awful lot of uh, guts, really, because, mm. you know, if it goes wrong um, and it backfires, then, you know, people can point the finger, really. So I think that was an awful, uh, awfully brave decision to, to, to play me. And I'm very, uh, very grateful um, um, that, that, that he, he actually did. Um, so a lot of respect for uh, Ray. Um, and uh, another, someone else you know well in, in Jim Ryan. I thought Jim was yeah. great. He was our reserve team manager. And then he got the job um, as the first team manager when he was technically still our friend. But, but we had an awful lot of respect for him. Um, yeah. And he did a great job. So I, I'm still friendly with Jim. He left Luton, went on to um, have a great career sort of behind the scenes at Manchester United. And I think a, um, a fair bit of that success might, um, you know, uh, it'd be because of uh, of Jim behind the scenes, most definitely. So, uh, um, yeah. Uh, and then we're going into uh, some other managers. I mean, you know David Fleet very well. I didn't play many yeah. games with David because I, I was transferred and obviously left for Spurs initially. Um, but also on loan at Millwall, where Mick McCarthy was the manager, and uh, on loan at uh, Sheffield United when Dave Bassett was the manager. Um, then Lenny Lawrence came to uh, Grimsby, who was wow, someone that yeah. you know as well. Yeah. Um, and then someone I played with um, four rather on um, um, many occasions was Alan Buckley. Alan Buckley was a good manager at Grimsby. He, yep. he re-signed me at Grimsby and he also um, signed me for Lincoln um, at the end of my career. So um, Alan was a good experienced manager. A lot of those managers uh, managed for more than a thousand games actually. Um, yeah. which uh, uh, was incredible, really, in, um, you know, in, in, in any era. Um, so, uh, but the person that I would need, because there are an awful lot of strong leaders in this team, <laughs> mm -hmm. and they would need a very, very strong leader at the top. So someone who is um, a, a legend um, of, yeah. of the game, really, um, not just at Nottingham Forest, but but Derby, um, and he's just just an um, was amazing character really, and uh, to have been signed by him, it was just um, uh, a massive vote of confidence that that someone yeah. of his uh, stature, of his standing in the game, of of, of someone who, that achieved so much, could actually you know, sign you, wow, you know, and I look back, that's just just something to, to behold for me. Um, so, um, Brian Clough? Brian Clough. <laughs> yeah. I can't believe you even tried to guess that. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, didn't, I didn't think we were going to guess that. that. It was so obvious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's your com competitiveness never leads you. Miles kind of, I'll have that one. <laughs> I, I knew you. I knew. You, I knew you both knew. I was. Just, I was just the first. Let me throw a little red herring in there. Let me see. I'm guessing it. <laughs> <laughs> I was just waiting for you to say it. That was all. That was all. But no, yeah. But, um, I, 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 I must admit. I, yeah, I um, remember when um, I'm going back to 1991, and uh, David Pleat had just taken over at, uh, at Luton, and uh, we. We were playing away at Chelsea at the time, and uh, the following day, actually, it was a Friday afternoon, and uh, David rang and he said, um, Kingsley, you are going to sign for Nottingham Forest. And I went, well, hang on, David, you know, we're, we're playing Chelsea away tomorrow, you know, I'm focused on the game. And he says, no, you're going to sign for Forest. And I said, well, no, I'm happy at Luton, uh, you know, it's <laughs> not something I've been thinking of. And uh, so anyway, he, he, he changed his tack and he said, um, uh, well, why don't you go up and speak to them? I said, oh, of course I'd do that, that, that you know, do that uh, courtesy. So he said, um, I'll pick you up in half an hour. So, blindly, this is, you know, Friday afternoon. <laughs> David Pete's coming around, pick me up in half an hour. He's going to take me up. We're going off to um, uh, halfway Northampton Post House at Crick. 
and uh, so anyway, in half an hour, you know, just quickly get ready, smarten myself up, really. And I, I, I had this sort of, um, uh, it was a, a gold-coloured watch. It certainly wasn't gold. Um, it was worth about fifty pounds. Anyway, I thought, hmm, looks a little bit flash. So um, I'm not going to wear this watch because I know that Brian Clough, um, he doesn't like jewellery, you know, fairly clean cut and things. So, um, so I, ha I had another watch, which was a Timex, which was the one I used to uh, go running in. So, you know, plastic strap, you know, worth a tenner. So uh, I slipped this watch on. Anyway, um, um, hour and a half later, I find myself at uh, um, uh, the... the, the the Trust House 40 at Crick, whatever. And uh, I'm sitting there in walks Brian Clark. has got his green jumper on and, uh, you know, he's got the presence and he comes in and you think, blimey, you know, he's got a, a real aura about him and he starts talking and he's talking with David. And, and anyway, so he sits down and he, and, and he looks at him and he said, um, can we, um, I'd like to swap watches with you. Right. So I'm thinking unusual, but, you know, I go with this. Um, so I take my £10 watch off. He's wearing it, hands me his watch, which was um, a gold rotary watch. Quite, I could feel the weight on it. And there I am. Right? So I'm, and, and he's starting to do some negotiations and the secretary of the club was there. And I'm there and I'm wearing his watch. And I'm thinking, hmm. You know, he's, I'm going to get, he's going to give me this watch. This is going to be great sort of thing. You know, I'm going to get Brian's club watch. <laughs> anyway, things move on and um, you, you have to appreciate we're in a, an open planned um, hotel foyer. You know, people checking out at the desk and there's sofas and there's people mulling around and everyone can see that Brian Clough's there because, you know, he, he had such an awe and a presence about him. And uh, we're sitting there on these, these sofas and he says to me, um, did you know that uh, my career uh, was uh, finished by a knee injury when I was um, about 28? I said, well, actually I did, um, you know, because I'd read about you. I knew he was a good goal scorer and uh, um, I, I knew that he uh, had a bad knee injury. And he said, I, uh, can I see your knees to me? So I thought unusual again, but I'll roll up my trousers and um, uh, and he has a look at uh, my knees. And then he stands up and he asks me, would I like to see his knees? Well, quite honestly, I'm not really sure that, that uh, but I knew the answer was yes, so I said yes. So, um, so in this open foyer, he literally, he, he stands up and he drops his trousers. He's standing there with his boxer shorts, with his trousers round his ankles and me looking at his knees as was David Plea, as was Bill Tomlings at the time. So, um, and that was uh, slightly bizarre, slightly bizarre. Really but, bizarre. Uh, actually, actually happened. And I, I actually, <laughs> I'll, I'll go on a, a little bit further. Uh, he, the, the, the secretary of the club was writing things down. And, like, it was a negotiation, basically. You know, they offer you... Um, so much a week or maybe a signing on fee, you, you, you know what happens, Mark. Mm. And uh, the secretary was writing it down. And at the end of this, he, um, he says, well, um, would you like to sign the contract? And he was very persuasive and, uh, you know, such a presence. I think, you, you, you know, you really wanted to play for him. It was just, just, just the aura about him. So he hands me this blank contract, basically, and asks me to sign it. And I thought for a split second, not sensible to sign a blank contract, but yeah. also uh, he, he, he trusts me, I'm going to trust him. So without any thought whatsoever, I signed this blank contract. Um, wow. And, uh, and that was it. The deal was done. The following day, um, Forrest were playing Oldham at home and uh, I get there at midday, I'm told to get there. And I go into um, Cluffy's office and there's the contract, exactly how we would um, had we negotiated the day before, to the T. And um, with, with exception of one thing, because um, there was a um, an allowance for a car, and he'd upped it by five thousand pounds. And I said, "Oh, excuse me, uh, did you do know that you we agreed um, actually less for me?" by £5,000. Um, he says, no, he says, because you trusted me, I've put an extra 5000 on your car allowance, as well as everything else being, you know, and that was the fact that um, 
you know, it was a trust thing. I suppose it was a was a test. But it was um, a test, yeah. I passed yeah. the test because I you I passed it, King. Really. You passed, passed it. Passed the test. <laughs> wow. Yeah. But the wow. funny thing was, yeah, it well was done. going on from the watch story. Yeah. Um, I think I arrive on the, the Tuesday. Bear in mind, I'd signed on the Saturday, and uh, I'd driven up from Luton at six six a.m. in the morning, and there were the first team were right at Man City. And uh, there, there was, uh, like on the, the notice board, there was two team sheets because there was the third team game and the first team game at Manchester City. And I'm on the, uh, the, the sheet for the third team away at Doncaster. So off I go, myself and Gary Parker. Gary, Gary was in that team as well. And uh, off we go up to Doncaster. Um, and we play the first half of this particular game. It finishes at sort of um, 4 p.m., whatever, and we're there to the end. And then uh, Ronnie Fenton was the assistant manager at Forest at the time. He says, right, you, you and uh, Gary Parker, uh, you're getting in the car. We're going off to Main Road uh, and uh, um, you're joining up with the first team. So anyway, uh, Bearing in mind that I was up at six in the morning, I'd driven to Nottingham, then gone up to Doncaster, played uh, 45 minutes in the third team, was now in the car. We arrive at the hotel near uh, Main Road just for the team meeting. So it's like 6 p.m. or whatever. And uh, uh, I'm named as a substitute in, for the first team game. <laughs> and at this point, I'm, so I do the warm up and I'm sitting there. I, I'll be honest with you, I'm shattered. The, the emotion of the last few days about signing and um, the travelling and everything that had happened over the last... I was absolutely shattered. And I didn't get on the pitch. Uh, they lost 1-0 or 2-1, whatever. Um, and afterwards, Brian Clough, he, um, he doesn't have a go at the team. He has a go at me. So, and I'm thinking, what's happening here? Because, quite honestly, I haven't even played. Not only have I not played tonight, I've not even played any any minutes for you yet and it was just the way of sort of trying to integrate me into um you know the setup really so because the actual game was nothing to do with me i hadn't played but uh, what was he uh, saying to you we didn't have a go at you. Uh, uh, just just you know um i, I don't think i can actually repeat it <laughs> 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 you, you can but, swear, uh, you can yeah. swear, Kings. We saw it's fine. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I don't think I will. But uh, <laughs> you know, it was. <laughs> it was just oh, sort of uh, what what he was trying to do was deflect from right. the team that had played. So in having a little go at me, just sort of meant that uh, um, a lot of reverse psychology, really. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. But, uh, but but then so on the Saturday. So, uh, you know, three days later, whatever, um, on the coach, we're away at Sheffield Wednesday. And uh, he's literally, uh, I should have gone back to the story where he, I had to give him his watch back during the, but he kept mine. <laughs> he kept yours? He, he kept mine, but I had to give his back. Um, <laughs> um, I should have mentioned that earlier. But the, during uh, going to the game at uh, Sheffield Wednesday on the back of the coach, um, he goes to the back of the coach and he's got my um, Timex watch in a plastic bag and he throws it at me and he said, I had it valued and it is rubbish. <laughs> or words to that effect. <laughs> and uh, that was it. And he says, by the way, you're starting today. So that was, yeah, <laughs> that wow. was that. Genius. Yeah. Genius. Yeah. And there yeah. we go. So unusual stuff, but uh, it uh, was. I hope you like the... Uh, the the stories. What what was it like when he moved on? Because um, we you you were at Forest when he when Frank Clark came in, weren't you? Yes. Yeah. So what was it like think, when Cluffy um, left? Was it like a passing of a, of a loved one? Was it that? I mean, obviously, because it kind of went a little bit downhill it compared was a to the standard. Time. I think it was a difficult time for um, uh, certainly a bit, a bit difficult for, for Brian himself actually uh, because such a legend of, of that football club and uh, with, with that season ending in, in relegation um, it, it, it was difficult it was difficult um, uh, I mean I, I always look back and I think that, that, that Teddy had left after you know two or three games and um, he, he'd gone to Tottenham and, and hadn't been replaced really um, so we, we were playing um, without really a recognised striker, and I think that that, that was very difficult. Um, and 
uh, that, that didn't help, I don't think. But um, so it was a difficult time, difficult time. Yeah. Okay. But uh, yeah, Frank Clark came in, he signed Stan Collymore, and, and that team got promotion. And I think this more or less the same team ended up being third in the Premiership the year later. So it just shows you that just little minor tweaks can, uh, although Stan Collymore was, uh, and Brian Roy were, you, you could argue, sort of major parts of that. But, uh, um, yeah, yeah. So, I was, hmm. was going to mention about um, a little bit about Ray Hartford there, but I think it might coincide with the, my question I have for the ex Luton town players we have on here. I always say to them, oh, what's, Kings, what's your most memorable Luton game and why? But I think I already know the answer to it, so that's why it's going to be so a co coincided yeah. with my question. Your most yeah. memorable Luton game and why? Well, there's a couple for me. The, the, the obvious okay. one was obviously the, the Littlewoods Cup final because um, I didn't expect to play. Um, it was... Um, you know, a last minute thing, really. I think I'm not 100% sure. I, th I think it might have been because of maybe a poor performance by the senior players in the Simod final against Reading. Um, and I think he wanted to sort of change it up and it might have, you know, needed a, a, maybe some balance on the left hand side, really. I always remember um, Ray, because uh, the, the, in, in the week we'd played to Queen's Park Rangers. And uh, he left me out of the side and, and I was either going to be sort of sub at the very least, if you know what I mean. So I was quite disappointed. And before the game, uh, he he's come into the office and uh, he said, oh, I'm going to, you know, I, I want to see how David Priest is going to do tonight. And, uh, um, you know, because he's lacking fitness and things, he needs 90 minutes. And uh, he said, but don't be too disappointed. And uh, this, was lead this was the week before the Littles Cup final. He said, don't be too disappointed. But I never really thought about his words at that point. Right. Um, because I think he meant, oh, you're a young player mm. and you'll get opportunities uh, in the future. But, but what he actually meant, looking back, was I think he'd already decided to play me in the Littlewoods Cup final. Um, so, but which, so I left quite sort of downhearted because I thought, that I'm not subbed tonight. That means I'm not going to be subbed uh, uh, on, on Sunday against Arsenal, really. So um, I've got a little bit, you know, a bit down with it, really. But um, we went into training and we trained on the Saturday um, afternoon. Um, and I remember um, there was like a blackboard that, that Ray was writing the names on, on the board. And uh, anyway, put the team up. And uh, he was in the way of where I was sitting to see the last couple of names. So I didn't see the fact that he'd written black number 11 um, until he moved away from the board. And it was at that moment, I, I can sort of nearly be there now, when it hit me that I could actually be playing the following day. And it was, the training session was a day's marvel. I just don't remember it. It was like, oh, it was, it was just a day's. Um, and uh, and then obviously what happened um, the following day is uh, you know in the history of Luton Town Football Club so uh, and a wonderful memory for me. So that's so one. That's that's, that's one. one game, it's the not the game. Derby it's... game. The Derby game when um, I think we were uh, the situation. In fact, I think we literally had to have won the last three games. Which, um, bearing in mind, we, we, we were in a um, you know poor league position, was looking unlikely, really. Um, and uh, anyway, we won the, the, the two um, previous games. Going into the last match, we've got to win, and Notting sorry Sheffield Wednesday have to lose, and they are at home to Nottingham Forest. Um, so all that I think I, all they need is a point, really. Yeah. Anyway. Forest win 3 0, as we know. Um, and um, all we really needed to do was, was win to stay up. But we don't know that at the time because obviously everything's ha happening simultaneously. And uh, um, Tim Breaker scores a wonderful goal, yeah. um, free kick. And then um, I managed to get to goal. So we're winning 2 0. Uh, Derby come back 2 2. Um, and then we're into the sort of the last 10 minutes or so really and uh, we sort of managed and, and this is a vivid memory scoring that goal to win 3-2 and a lot of the crowd were in fancy dress as, as was um, 
what people did on the last game of the season, certainly Luton fans, you know. And I just remember the crowd behind that goal, um, behind Peter Shorten's goal, went absolutely wild when the ball went in the net. And we won 3-2. And, yep. uh, and that was unexpected. And uh, I just remember that being a wonderful, wonderful memory too. That, so uh, That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. But Mike, um, the why I was going to mention the Litwas Cup because I mean I think we mentioned it a while ago. Back then there was no mobile phones or anything like that. But you didn't quite get to celebrate like playing in the Litwas Cup final, and you've like now been man of the match, which is great. And I don't know, let you carry on the story what happened with regards why I'm talking about that you didn't quite get to celebrate because of international so called duties, so to speak. Yeah. You remember that? Yeah. Yeah, well what happened was Marv, you know, we went to the Savoy Hotel and there was a big black tie do and um I just remember it, obviously because we're all um you know in, 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 in fantastic mood because we just just sort of won big football match and uh, we're at the meal and a, a waiter comes up to me at the Savoy and he says uh, there's a phone call um, for you so off I go to this particular phone which was just on the wall in in this big massive ballroom that uh, was obviously hosting this this lavish event and uh, it was Billy Bingham on the phone so uh, um, asking me to play for Northern Ireland so he'd obviously watched the match and uh, traced me to um, the Savoy Hotel where we all were and uh, asked me to play for Northern Ireland. So, uh, yeah, and uh, wow. there was a little bit of a hoo-ha because the following day, um, um, just before we went to, because we were going to the town hall for, um, you know, the trophy to, to be presented and uh, like open bus tour. And uh, I was at my mum and dad's house at the time. And, uh, um, that the front door was uh, was double locked, so and and the key wasn't there, so I couldn't actually. I mean, I, one of my friends had just knocked at the door, but at the same time, the phone rang, and uh, so I had to pick up the phone, and I couldn't get, I couldn't, I couldn't actually open the front door. Uh, anyway, this guy's on the phone, and and you know what it's like with some of the lads, sort of with wind ups and things like that. They're sort of like. This fella was saying, I would like you to play for England and I'm um, thinking, uh, you know, so I'm thinking, who's this on the wind-up? I thought it was my mate Frank on the wind-up. And uh, basically, I, it, was, it took me about sort of 30 seconds to realise this was actually Bobby Robson on the phone and not someone just winding me up. And uh, he asked me if I, to, to play for the 21s uh, for England. And uh, um, anyway, it so happened that... Uh, um, I spoke to Billy Bingham again and I ended up playing for Northern Ireland, made my debut for Northern Ireland on that Wednesday um, at home to France at uh, Windsor Park. Um, but I then went to open the door, got the key, and there my friend was, and I said, I'm really sorry, I had Bobby Robson on the phone. And that's where, <laughs> we'll put it this way, he didn't quite believe me. <laughs> fantastic. Absolutely yeah. fantastic. Yeah. So, yeah. Wow. That, was, that was that really so yeah it seems like yesterday all these memories long many years ago but uh they're, they're quite vivid because they're, they're they're important things in your um, yeah. in, in your memory in your um football career anyway so yeah so yeah. i mean i i want to like on behalf of myself and andrew thank you kings ever so very much for coming on here Pleasure, and, Mark. Uh, Pleasure, doing your best thank you so much thank you so so yeah. much we do like to, we do like to just like to let the listeners, especially being a, a Luton boy, and, and most of our listeners are probably are going to be Luton um, people. What what are you doing at the moment? Just to give them a little bit of feedback of what you're around. Are you coaching, or are you just like? I have done um, a little bit of coaching, Marv, um, but but it's not not so for me. It was involved with sort of Luton Town, but with a college course. So I did that for a couple of years, but um, I, I've sort of been more involved in, in property over the years, um, um, residential, uh, commercial um, letting really, and um, letting a property abroad, namely in Mallorca, which, um, which, which I've been doing really. So property based, um, so away from football really, and uh, you know, different, different fields, but uh, um, that's, uh, that, that's what really I've been up to. So, Excellent. Um, yeah. Great. 
Well, thank you so much for your time, Kingsley. Um, and the final thank one goes to you, um, to fans of any club. Is there anything you want to say um, to the fans who are listening to this um, and have great memories of you? Um, is there anything you want to say to them? Um, I, I think I was very fortunate in, in my career, having played, um, you know, starting at my hometown club of Luton, the team I support, um, and I'm still a fan of, um, amazing memories. To, to be able to play alongside uh, the, the people that uh, um, you, you watched on the terraces. Um, so from a fan's point of view, imagine that, you know, what one two years later, you're actually lining up alongside these guys that are heroes uh, of yours, um, you know. And then, you know, having the, uh, the pleasure of playing uh, at Forest, who, who are a massive club with wonderful history, with wonderful players, um, great fan base and, and, and uh, legendary managers, really. Um, it was was an honour, um, and then going on to Grimsby as well. Uh, former colleague Brian Laws at Forest signed me for Grimsby, and uh, and we had great times there. There were some wonderful players at Grimsby too. Um, great fan base. So it was like five years at Luton, five years at Forest, five years at uh, Grimsby. Um, a few loans at Millwall and Sheffield United who were great um, and then finishing my career at Lincoln really so um, I think I was sort of um, very fortunate to, to play for those clubs and uh, in, enjoyed every, every moment so I, I thank the fans um, and uh, every, everyone at those clubs. Excellent. Thank you so much, thank you so thank much you. for your time um, and that brings okay. to another episode of My Best 11 podcast. Thank you very much Kingsley Black. Thank you.